Good, okay, good afternoon and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is now 3 o'clock. We will go ahead and get this session moving along. Uh, my name is Lyle Holton. I'm with AECOM. We provide contract support to HUD through a Community Compass Technical Assistance Program. We're very happy to have you all here. And uh, before we get started, I've just got a couple of things I wanted to uh, clear up for the day. First, everyone's muted upon entering. This is going to continue throughout the course of the webinar. If you have a technical question or an issue, um, please make sure to enter that into the chat box at the bottom right. If you don't see a chat box at the bottom right, make sure that the chat icon is lit blue at the top of your interface and that chat box will open up. Also, submit your message when you do that to host and presenters so that all of us can see that. Also, throughout the course of the uh, session, to, particularly towards the end, we will have a Q&A period. However, there are also Q&A panels there. I'm sorry, somebody's having an issue. Thank you. I will see what we can fix. Um, the Q&A panel will open and um, that, we, that will be the location for you to put and insert any of your questions uh, as we move forward. I think that's the majority of the housekeeping. Just make sure to designate all of your chats to the hosts and the presenters. That way we can all work together um, as we're going along and uh, we can get the information out. Thank you. Starting today, the uh, welcome. This is me taking the time right now. I'm sorry for a little bit of confusion. It seems like some folks were having some issues with hearing me. Um, I hope that that's okay, uh, that those are being resolved. Please make sure that you have turned on the audio of your computer. Um, you may be, your microphone should be muted, but your speakers need to be unmuted, and then you should be able to hear uh, through that instance. My fellow panelists are saying they can hear me, so I do believe that uh, that, that would be a, a an issue or a particular way to fix it for you. Um, so I do think that takes care of some of the basic housekeeping with the one exception that I wanted to remind everyone this session is being recorded today and will be posted on the HUD exchange, uh, both the presentation as a PDF once we've 508 made it compliant and a recording of the webinar itself so that you will actually have an audio record that you can work with and tie that to the presentation. Um, they will be available on the HUD Exchange website, same locations where you went to register uh, in the coming weeks. So just to get us moving on today, I just wanted to go through our agenda quickly. Um, we've done the welcome and logistics for today. We've got a you know, health and home overview, Michael Freeberg, our sponsor and principal uh, grants monitor from HUD. will be giving you a little bit of an overview of this project and the activities that we've been going through. Then we'll shift to Ellen Tone from Tone Environmental Strategies. She will be discussing the uh, additional, more detail into the guidance document, as well as some information on keeping it well maintained later on in the, in the program. Also today, Paul Francisco from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign is going to be joining us and discussing how to keep your home and the home retro, uh, retrofits thermally controlled, as well as energy efficient. And then we have identified the need for a possible ninth principle over HUD's eighth housing principles, and that is how to incorporate active design into your retrofits. And Mary Ayala from Enterprise Community Partners will be leading that with us today. These, as I say, are our presenters that will be joining us um, as we go along. And then I'm gonna transfer this over to Michael. Michael, it is now your turn. I'm moving it and it's all yours, sir. You need to unmute and you're good to go. There you go. Okay, okay great. Um, thank you, Leo. Thank you all for joining us. Just want to welcome all of you here on behalf of HUD. Um, I'm in the Office of Environment and Energy, and uh, we are sponsoring this training series. Um, uh, for those of you who've been able to attend all four sessions, you'll be receiving a certificate of completion um, in the mail and will also be eligible for a health at home technical consultation from our TA providers. 
and we'll be providing you with some information about how to uh, request that TA at the end of this webcast. Um, I don't have to uh, tell anybody who's tuned in today about the importance of healthy housing. Never been more clear as we make our homes more energy efficient, as we're spending more time in our homes due to the uh, coronavirus. And the CDC just this week confirmed the importance of ventilation and filtration uh, in our homes uh, as a result of the potential for transmission of the virus to small aerosols which could be conveyed in the indoor environment. But even before the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, we've, we're all aware that uh, asthma triggers um, can be found in the home and cleaning the indoor environment can have a positive contribution. So we'll be hearing more about that today. This is the fourth of the uh, four series, uh, four sessions in the series. Um, and um, they are organized around the Help at Home guidelines, which can be found on the HUD website. These guidelines were prepared and assembled by a group of technical experts, AECOM, uh, Tone Environmental Associates and Livable Housing, Inc. And the importance here is to how to best integrate these guidelines in your uh, rehab project. The focus is on moderate rehab, home remodeling, or home repair programs, primarily in single family and low rise multifamily housing, although much of this can also apply in high rise or mid rise multifamily housing. For substantial gut rehab, we we strongly encourage and we actually assume that in many cases you are using one or more of these green building standards where uh, healthy uh, uh, measures and criteria are built into those programs to some degree or another. Uh, what we're going to do is really focus on uh, when you're not adopting one of those standards, how you can address healthy housing principles. I do want to mention before turning this over to Ellen that we uh, have an OFA notice of funding availability on the street. Uh, there's five million available to um, uh, folks who are interested in uh, combining weatherization assistance with HUD, uh, lead hazard control and healthy housing funds. This is a program uh, that is designed to demonstrate that coordinating healthy housing and weatherization can improve outcomes in the health, safety, and efficiency area. Um, if you uh, are interested in this NOFA, please go to the HUD website and, um, uh, or contact the Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Housing at HUD. With that, I'm going to pass this on to Ellen Tone, who's been a uh, uh, an expert and a leader in this space uh, for as long as all of us can remember, many of us can remember. Um, she's been involved both on the technical side, but also working with local communities about how to integrate uh, weatherization and healthy housing and energy efficiency. Uh, the One Touch program is, I think, her brainchild, and we've been delighted to have her. Uh, essentially be the lead instructor for this series. So Ellen, over to you. Great, thanks so much, Michael. Pleasure to be here. As Michael said, we know that our homes impact our health. So a brief reminder for those who might have been on the earlier calls, just a, three quick examples. For asthma, nearly one in 10, so 8% of adults and children in the United States currently report having asthma. That's quite a lot. And 20 to 40% of those cases can be linked to some some home environment. So if you just think about that, one in three of asthma cases and attacks can be linked to where someone lives. So that means we have a very powerful lever in the way we rehab homes and develop homes to minimize asthma risk, which for, for children is one of the leading cause of hospitalizations. Second, um, radon. 
7 million homes have potential radon risks, and over 21,000 deaths EPA estimates every year can be linked to radon exposure. Again, a pretty easy fix during renovation. We discussed that one in our previous webinars. And maybe for the biggest number is when we look at seniors, one in four over the age of 65 fall each year, and half of those falls occur in the home. So it's a really significant number of trip and fall hazards in homes. And again, the way we do our rehab can make a difference. So just a few examples to make this real, really feel quite real. The way the help at home guidelines are organized, as Michael said, are around the nine principles of healthy housing. We've covered everything except for the last three gears on your lovely uh, slide here. So today we're going to talk about thermal, making sure homes are thermally controlled, uh, have attention to active design, which Mary will walk us through, and are well maintained. So we have it organized by principle. And when you open the document, you'll therefore see the recommendations organized by principle. Here's an example from Keep It Dry. And we give you very uh, laconic, tersely written specs on what to do to prevent stormwater management leaks, um, uh, moisture and surfaces, just using this example. And each of our speakers today will show you those exact guidelines for their topic and then walk us through them. But we know that a lot of rehab programs don't think about, uh, about their standards by principle. You think about them by building component category. That's how you write your standards. And so we've done a really nifty crosswalk for those of you who like tables. And you can see for dry, um, we keep a drive principle, each of those standards I mentioned, uh, stormwater management leaks, we can show you that that's showing up in the site category and roofing, building exterior, founders, foundations, and structure. So you can see the crosswalk. And even more importantly, if you do think about it at a component-based level, we've written the standards up at a component-based level. Here's an example of how that looks. So around site standards, uh, we, again, provide the backwards crosswalk, which principle it applies to. We list um, specific activities with both a repair and a replacement standard, which I think is a familiar presentation for many of you who have rehab specs. So we've given you, really, there's no wrong door into this, whether you think about it by principle or building component, we have you covered, and we've got the same content organized in a different way. So I want to now set the stage uh, for uh, the beginning of our discussion about how to keep homes thermally controlled and highlight some of what we've learned in two recent studies that I had the pleasure of participating in, one for the Department of Energy shown on the left here, Home Rx, Health Benefits of Home Performance, and then a related document for E done by E for the Future, um, Occupant Health Benefits of Residential Energy Efficiency. I want to uh, credit my co-authors, the National Center for Healthy Housing, and also three cubes who played an important role on um, one of these documents. So what do we know about some of what Paul's going to talk about, making homes thermally comfortable? Um, these are studies that looked at energy efficiency. And in your rehab work, you may not do a full-blown energy efficiency job. We certainly encourage you to work with weatherization and energy programs. But just to put this in context, that work typically involves sealing up holes, air sealing, um, insulation, heating system upgrades. I'm now looking at the left column of my chart. Ventilation, particularly bath fan ventilation, venting dryers, and efficient cooking appliances. When you do all of that, you get changes in the indoor home conditions. And those are shown in the blue boxes. Warmer, drier air. We get better temperature, less moisture in the air. We see uh, fewer moist, just generally less moisture and mold, fewer particulates from combustion. Um, and fewer allergens. And when we do that efficiency, we lower people's bills. So working backwards up, we know when we lower people's bills, particularly lower income households, there's less stress and better mental health, very well documented. And the other activities to the indoor environment result in these improvements in health shown in green. And I'm going to go through a few of those in the next slide. Um, and then not just changes in symptoms, but reduced hospitalizations and medical visits, which is our R on the far right. So we, we have pretty good evidence looking at about 40 studies that energy efficiency can improve indoor conditions and occupant health. 
And when we dial down into that, um, just looking at it in a little more detail, we can see from these studies, most of which were actually done in lower income households, so really aligned with some of this HUD work, that we see improvements generally in this respiratory and allergy symptoms and being a little more granular reductions in allergies. You'll see asthma is in italics here with an asterisk. There's one study that has some mixed results, but many studies that show positive results. And so on that, we think there's an improvement there. Reductions in colds, sinus infections, throat irritation and wheezing. So a variety of respiratory related issues. And then studies have also documented, and one of these is Paul's actually, reductions in headaches, um, hypertension, thermal stress, and several studies have done quite a bit of looking at uh, getting folks to rate their overall physical health and mental health and showing significant improvements. Um, and you'll see improvements in the indoor environment uh, on the far right. Um, again, the ones in italics with radon, this is an earlier studies on radon, and Paul and I have since done several subsequent studies on radon um, where we're showing uh, not negative consequences at all, but uh, positive, neutral or positive consequences. So I think we can adjust that um, finding from these earlier reports. And we see reductions at a hospitalization in both asthma and respiratory health. Just um, giving you a sense of which of those studies are the reductions in emergency visits comes from a national evaluation of the uh, DOE weatherization program, better control of asthma comes from a study um, that I'll say a little bit more in a moment about, and we have many studies, as I mentioned, on the overall physical and mental health. So just to give you one study in particular, and then I'm going to be right on time to turn up to Paul, I hope. This is a study in Washington State for high-risk um, children with asthma that was out of control. It's very well documented that a three-visit community health worker protocol can make that asthma better under control. We don't usually get rid of asthma. We just make it a condition that doesn't interrupt going to school or work or sleep and it's under control. So half the kids got that and half the kids got um, the community health worker plus a energy efficiency with addition, some additional rehab, which is shown here. The energy kinds of work I described in my first slide, which now for most programs also comes with bath bands, but you can see a, a few other rehab activities that were also done here, spending about $4,000 per apartment. So what did that actually yield? What you'll see here is the orange bar showing the improvements in indoor environmental conditions with just the community health worker. That's just the uh, female character shown there. And the orange bar, 28 and 29% reduction in moisture and mold conditions. But when you add in energy efficiency with that very modest little repair, you more than doubled uh, the reductions in mold and a, a um, additional improvement in moisture. And most importantly, that led to improvements in asthma under control. A year after the work was done, there was a 48% improvement for asthma out of control. Way more kids had asthma under control. And the kids, and there, and there was a 23% added benefit for clients who also got the weatherization energy efficiency work on top of the community health worker visit. So just to dial into a specific study, we do feel quite confident that energy efficiency can improve health benefits. So in terms of what it means to do energy efficiency, I'll turn it over to my friend and colleague, Paul Francisco, who, with whom I've done many studies and written guidance for DOE and EPA. He, uh, is at the, he has appointments at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, and Colorado State University, and Paul will teach us about thermal comfort. Okay, thank you very much, Ellen, and thank you to uh, the hosts for having me. So yeah, I'll talk about Keep It Thermally Controlled. It's also now being referred to as Keep It Comfortable. Um, and why does it matter in terms of health? Why does energy efficiency matter in terms of health? Well, Ellen just talked about some data, but I'll give some additional context. If we even just think about extreme conditions, extreme heat, uh, in 2017, the CDC said that kills about 600 people every year, which is more than all of the other severe weather events combined, such as hurricanes and tornadoes. And about 40% of the people who are killed by extreme heat every year are older adults. Um, then we've got cold. 
63, even though extreme heat is more than all the other severe weather events combined, cold, even if it's not extreme cold, actually corresponds to that 63% of all of the temperature-related deaths in the country. This is also from the CDC. As I said, it's not necessarily extreme cold, but it stresses the body. And so it, it may lead to some other issues. Additionally, thermal stress is linked to reduce productivity, um, such as balance and cognitive function, decision making. It's linked to reduced learning, and it may increase susceptibility to other issues as well. And that is something that we're certainly faced with now, especially as we're going into the, uh, the winter time, and there's all this concern about coronavirus, and maybe we need to increase ventilation, but we can't just compromise our thermal comfort because that may increase our susceptibility. Uh, Ellen showed this document already that talks about the benefits of home performance on, on health. When we do a house as a system approach, we don't just think of one specific piece, but we really look at the house in a holistic manner we see that it can really help on many of the keep it principles. Of the nine keep it principles, it directly impacts keep it dry, keep it ventilated, keep it contaminant free. It can also have benefits on things such as keep it pest free. And of course, home performance is really focused on keeping it comfortable or thermally controlled. So the concept behind home performance and keeping homes comfortable, thermally controlled, it's, it's a two-step process. It is not just about insulation, and it's not just about efficient appliances. What we want to do is first reduce demand as much as possible. If you reduce demand, you've gained control over your space. And so we, we want to reduce the demand as much as we possibly can in a reasonable fashion through primarily air sealing and insulation. And once we've got that control to where we don't necessarily have hot spots and cold spots in the home, we can now, whatever we still need to supply to keep the home thermally comfortable, we want to supply that as efficiently as possible through high efficiency heating systems and cooling systems and good controls that mean you're not just running it when it's not needed, but it's you know with what things like setback thermostats that really allow you to save energy at certain times when you're not really needing to keep the uh, the house as uh, much of a normal temperature as when you're in the space. So here are the health and home guidelines for keep thermally controlled. Uh, I'm not going to go through them here. You see that there are these numbers, 8.1 to 8.7. In following slides, I will have those sections referenced. I'm not going to point that out every time, but that's what those numbers are going to mean in following slides. I'm not doing it in this order. I'm doing it more in the order of demand followed by supply and then moving on past that. We we'll start with reducing demand air sealing. Air sealing is extremely important. It is considered really one of, in weatherization, three major demand reducing measures. The three major demand reducing measures are air sealing, wall insulation, and attic insulation. Now, when it comes to air sealing, a lot of people are first thinking about windows and doors. You feel drafts from those. It's something people are always thinking about. They see the windows and doors. Sometimes you see daylight around the windows and doors. So you think that may be the big leaks. And while we certainly do want to consider windows and doors because they are absolutely sources of leakage, it tends to be that what's most important are large, much larger leaks like chases and soffits. There are a whole lot of homes where there may be a basement and then some shaft that's got plumbing or ducts or a chimney, and it's open all the way up to the attic, in which case you just have this huge bypass going from the basement to the attic. So that's one example of a much larger um, bypass. So just to kind of put this in perspective a little bit, there's a metric called ACH50. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. ACH50 is basically what is the flow that's required to move through a house to depressurize it by 50 pascals and then normalize by the volume of the house. So how many air changes per hour would you get if the house was depressurized by 50 pascals? In new homes, 
The code requires, depending on your climate zone, three to five air changes at 50. Colder climate zones, or the requirement is three. Warmer climate zones, such as in Florida, the five would be the maximum allowable ACH 50. When you look at retrofit situations, you know, for example, in Illinois, the average weatherization client, low-income Illinois Home Weatherization Assistance Program client, is more like 20 air changes at 50. That's the average. There are some homes that are double that. In fact, the leakiest home I've measured was four times that. It was basically barely even had walls at that point. So one of the things about, about this is it, it shows that we can have some extremely larger leakage levels in many homes. And in fact, in 2010, a national evaluation of the weatherization assistance program found also that the average client from that 2010 evaluation had about that same 20 air changes at 50. So the 20 air changes at 50 corresponds to about 4,000 cubic feet per minute at 50 pascal depressurization. One, every 1,000 CFM 50 corresponds to about 100 square inches of opening. So if you have 1,000 CFM 50, you can think of a two foot wide window, so 24 inch wide window being open about four inches. That corresponds to about 1,000 CFM 50. So then the average weatherization home is four times that. So we're talking about that same two foot wide window being open 16 inches. So the point here is that while we certainly want to be looking at doors and windows for where there may be issues related to leakage, that's probably not going to be enough to get your house to be tight. You're still going to need to go find other big leaks, and that's one of the major reasons people use blower doors, so that they can identify those big leaks and use the, the blower door to guide their air sealing. And weatherization typically will reduce leakage by 30 to 40 percent. Some homes get a lot more. Some homes are already pretty tight, might not see much, but they didn't need very much. When you get really leaky homes, sometimes you can get 60, 70 percent reductions in air leakage. So again, don't ignore the doors and windows. Caulk, as is mentioned in the Health and Home Guide, uh, it may help reduce drafts and thereby influence comfort and also help keep it dry. The caulk a lot of times is used to help keep water from getting in. So it's not just about thermal comfort. It is also about keep it dry. A lot of times sash locks on windows are not working very well. So there's a big gap where the, if, if it's a double pane or single or double hung or single hung window where the um, or sections of window meet, they may not work very well and causing some pretty big drafts. And those are very easy to fix, very inexpensive and easy to do. Weather stripping and door sweeps can really shut drafts off. Um, one thing to keep in mind is people might complain about their windows being drafty. That's not always the case. You can think about just sitting next to a really large window. Um, and, and you can feel how that window is cold. The window is, because the window is cold, it has these convective currents. And so you might feel the cold, you might feel air movement, but it's not necessarily going through from outside. It may well be going vertically up and down the window. So that's something to keep in mind, that just because you feel air moving out a window does not mean it's a leak, but it might be a leak, and so you do want to evaluate those windows. Okay, moving on to another part of reducing demand, insulation. So insulation also improves your ability to condition the home. It's giving you that control. Now, we think primarily about insulation, about reducing heat loss through the, through the building section, whether it's the wall or through the attic, through the ceiling. And so we're reducing that conductive heat loss. One of the other benefits of insulation, when it's especially when it's installed properly, is that it can improve the temperature of the wall. We respond, people respond about 50-50 to air temperature and surface temperatures. So if the surface temperature is cold, we're going to lose heat through radiant heat transfer to those surfaces. So when we insulate those surfaces, it warms up those or when we insulate the walls, it warms up those surfaces, reduces our heat loss, our body heat loss to those surfaces by also, and also by increasing the surface temperatures, it reduces the chance for mold growth. 
mold growth on surfaces will is a combination of higher humidity and cold surfaces. So if we can warm up those surfaces, it will reduce our chance for mold growth, and therefore we're also having an impact on keep it dry, keep it contaminant free. So one key about insulation is that it actually has to be in contact with the surface. If there's an air gap between the insulation and the surface, like if it's in a wall and there's a gap within the wall, you're going to have air currents within the wall and you're going to sacrifice a significant amount of performance of that insulation. Another thing to keep in mind with insulation is in terms of health in homes is that that not all insulation is the same. Some insulation is loaded with chemicals and it is good to focus on insulation that has lower levels of chemicals. There's a healthy buildings network that has a list of um, considerations and so you can go look at healthy buildings network for uh, recommendations of more environmentally friendly, less chemically laden insulation that may not have formaldehyde, for example which is a concern in some spray foams. So here are a couple of examples of insulation installations that were not done very well. You can see in the little picture on the left where it's, you've got a bat going over the joists in the attic and there's big gaps underneath. There's nothing preventing the cold air from getting underneath the insulation. You're just not getting the benefits. For the picture on the right with the walls, you see how the insulation has been pressed into the wall. So when you put up the drywall, there's going to be a big gap. You will not get that R19 that is advertised. Um, now, in retrofit applications, we typically are not using bats so much. We're using a lot of loose fill, especially in attics and walls. For attics, we just blow in a lot of uh, cellulose, and one of the great things about that is it can find all those little nooks and crannies, and so you don't have the big gaps that you might with the bat insulation. In the walls, because we've already got the walls up in the retrofit application, you don't want to tear the wall apart to put in bat insulation, so we tend to do dense pack cellulose that has both advantages for insulation as well as for air sealing. By having that dense packed, it really does can cut off a significant amount of air leakage that might be going through those walls. When you do have open walls, such as you will have in knee walls um, and crawl spaces in basements, or if you're bringing the attic inside and finishing at the roof, a lot of times that's where you will use bats or foam. Uh, spray foam is, you know, we want to make sure that the spray foam is not loaded with some of the more problematic chemicals. But one of the nice things about it is it's really resistant to gravity pulling it down. Gravity will pull bats down. Once the, once the spray foam is in, it will usually stick pretty well. If you are using bats, you really need to have something, some kind of facing as an air barrier. Uh, fiberglass or cellulose insulation is not itself an air barrier, but if you have paper or vinyl, then that can create that air barrier so you don't have air going through the insulation and compromising some of that effectiveness. So here we've got on the uh, left and right pictures of spray foam being used on the wall or in a, in a uh, uh, rim joist cavity. And then the picture in the middle shows vinyl face bats in a uh, basement wall. Crawl spaces. Something I see in crawl spaces all too often is where people have put insulation on the walls with the idea that you want to bring the crawl space thermally inside, keep the plumbing warm, keep the ducts warm, but then they put vents in in order to, they think, keep it dry. Well, what you've done is you basically open windows throughout the crawl space through the insulation and it's not doing very much. So you either want to have if you're going to have a vented crawl space, you really need to um, insulate under the floor, as is shown in this picture. Usually that's done with bats, although it can be done with spray foam. If it's bats, it has to have strapping to hold it up. Um, if you can get away with not having vents, then perimeter insulation is much better, which can be like the vinyl-faced bats that I showed in the previous slide or spray foam insulation, again, trying to have it be more environmentally friendly. Okay, so those are demand side reductions and demand side um, energy efficiency for thermal control. Moving into the supply side, that's where, you know, how are we heating or cooling our homes? Well, first, one of the things we want to do, all too frequently, systems get oversized. And the idea is, well, we want to make sure you've got enough capacity. Oversizing equipment, for the most part, doesn't lead to good outcomes. 
it increases cycling losses, which relates to uh, efficiency losses. If you're in a situation where you're trying to dehumidify, oversizing an air conditioner will really compromise your ability to dehumidify the air. The one exception to oversizing is with heat pumps. If you're allowing the heat pump to run all the way to cold temperatures, you can still get some improved compressor efficiency out of that, which reduces your need for more expensive, um, for more expensive fuels. And so it, it can be really beneficial to let the heat pump run as far down as possible, in which case oversizing can be a good thing. And then we've got wind supply met demand, and that's our ducts. The ducts are trying to supply the heating or cooling, but if they have a lot of heat loss, they're increasing the demand. The furnace or air conditioner has to put in more space conditioning in order to keep the building thermally comfortable. A ducts outside the conditioned space, measurements of many studies over the last 30 years have shown that many duct systems outside the conditioned space, such as crawl spaces and attics, at 10% or larger leakage, it can be 20 to 40% energy penalties, even worse for heat pumps. These really need to be sealed properly. And ducts are in nasty places. People don't like to go there, and that's part of why they stay uh, troubled. But that can oftentimes be the single largest source of energy savings in a house. So um, they do have to be sealed properly, mechanical fasteners to keep the sections together. And then mastic duct tape does not work. As you see in the picture on the right, the heating and cooling the thermal cycling will cause the duct tape to fail and it can fall off. Uh, the picture on the left shows where they didn't use mechanical fasteners. They just assumed friction would work, and it didn't. So, so once so we've talked about demand, we've talked about supply, and then when supply meets demand, all of these trying to give you more control over the thermal comfort in your home, the ability to deliver thermal comfort in the home, and to do it efficiently as, as possible. Um, programmable thermostats help with the efficiency, and also Energy Star appliances. And one thing to keep in mind is health in our homes is not just about what happens in our homes, it's also what happens outside our homes. So when we use these efficient appliances, including things like refrigerators and, and cooking appliances that are energy star, that are therefore efficient, that reduces how much energy we need to generate, how much electricity we may need to generate. We still have a lot of our electricity is generated using fossil fuels, which means that when we're generating that electricity, that is being put into the air, the combustion products are being put into the air. So to the extent that we can reduce how much energy we need, how much electricity we need, we can be reducing how much contaminant we're putting into the air outside, which could eventually find its way into our homes. So in summary, and I think I'm just about right on time here, uh, thermal comfort is important for more than just being comfortable, it's for health, performance, and learning. Air cooling and insulation can really reduce the need for space conditioning and help maintain comfort in the home, help you be able to maintain comfort in the home. Properly sized uh, space conditioning systems optimize the ability to deliver comfort. Don't oversize the system because that will actually impede your ability to deliver comfort. And don't forget about the ducts. The ducts are like the, the veins, the arteries that are going through our body. That's how you're getting what you need from one place to the other, when those are, are compromised, then you lose a significant amount for both comfort and energy. You can have entirely cold sections because the air isn't getting there in the winter. Um, so don't forget about that. And I believe that is everything. So Great. thank you, Paul. To We're gonna to Alex. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paul. You can mute yourself and Mary if you want to put yourself on video while I introduce you. So thrilled to have Mary Ayala join us. She's the program director with Enterprise Community Partners. We already mentioned their green communities criteria in one of the slides. Uh, Mary's work focuses uh, and centers on how housing can be used as a platform for health promotion, both in affordable housing development and cross-sector partnerships before joining Enterprise. She came from a healthcare setting, which I think gives you a particularly unique window on this. So let me hand it off to Mary. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Okay. All good. All right, perfect. So thank you, Ellen. I'm excited to be here today to talk with you all about active design. Um, I thought I would start off with 
discussing the definition of what active design is. And active design is when design decisions are made to increase the frequency and or duration of physical activity. Um, one second, I am very sorry. We are all balancing working from home and and kids and so bad timing. Sorry, one second. Okay. Thank you. I am so sorry about that. <laughs> so um, we don't have many locks in our house, and so it makes our presentation sometimes being difficult. But um, back to the presentation. The design decisions that are made within your building are going to influence how often people are moving around and participating in physical activity. And we know that physical inactivity is linked to a lot of major chronic diseases that exist across the United States. As Ellen mentioned, in my experience working for a healthcare system, we saw that health needs like obesity, hypertension, heart disease, stroke, cancers, these are all things that are influenced by physical activity, and these are needs that consistently come up in the communities across the United States that we are probably all working in. Just to provide a little bit of background on how effective physical active design features can be, the evidence base illustrates that actually just increasing your staircase usage to two minutes a day can burn enough calories to prevent annual average weight gain. And common and frequent stair use is actually reduced to, stro uh, to a reduced stroke risk and decrease in all cause mortality. All right. Um, just wanting to highlight that healthy housing, that active design is category nine of the healthy housing guidelines in the HUD guidance. So <laughs> today I'm going I'm going to walk you through um, what Enterprise has um, has kind of learned through our pilots and our different work around active design. We've chosen to include active design in our Enterprise Green Communities criteria since 2015. And as a part of its inclusion, we've worked with developers across the country with different pilots specifically around active design. Mm -hmm. And along with that, a process for incorporating health in the development of affordable housing. I will draw on examples from these pilots today. So let's get into the first one. Um, as I talk about the pilots, I'm going to speak about three different key um, pieces of, or different strategies that you can utilize to ensure that you're touching on the appropriate physical activity um, strategies within your development to match the needs of your residents. And the first way of doing that is actually by engaging residents or community stakeholders. And you'll see that theme throughout all of these examples. One of um, the pilot participants we worked with said residents are experts at what they're experiencing. And I think it's as simple as that. Studies illustrate that when you do engage with your community to select the strategies that you're going to utilize within your development for active design, that those strategies are more likely to be utilized by residents. Additionally, you build trust with residents and relationship with community stakeholders, and you also see that it lends credibility to the um, selection of strategies that you choose. And we have had developers come back to us to indicate that because they have done that community engagement and have that data, that they've been able to receive grants to pay for some of their active design features. So the first development I wanted to highlight was a LGBTQ affirming affordable housing development that focused on seniors in Seattle. And they wanted the active design elements that they incorporated to fit into the culture of the community that they were trying to build and offer opportunities to an aging population with a varying degree of mobility. So the first thing they did was host a design charrette. And in this design charrette, they were able to lift up a couple of major themes from the community stakeholders. And that included the want to incorporate character and the kind of culture that they were hoping to exhibit within their building into the um, active design features. Additionally, they wanted to, as mentioned, offer a variety of opportunities for physical 
activity that would meet the various mobility levels of residents, and then have opportunity to incorporate culture, art, music, and performance within the active design element. So taking that feedback, they were able to um, design for things that met those needs. And one of those was actually incorporating an interior space for performances. And that space was connected to a stairwell that I'll talk a little bit about in a second that incorporated the culture of the community that was going to be living there. A couple of additional things, you know, they had uh, raised beds in the exterior space and they ensured that they were, that they had wide edges so that people could sit next to the raised beds and do the gardening rather than having to bend over, which can be difficult on um, many people's backs and discourage use of these design elements that are incorporated. So to touch quickly on the staircase, this was kind of the big element that they focused on. They realized that in a seven-story building, they probably weren't going to have people use the stairs to always access their units, but they could have one feature staircase that could be incorporated into some of the arts and cultural activities that were going to take place on site as well. So they decided to design this grand staircase to um, that was kind of like overly exaggerated and would be a feature point that people would want to use and that people would use for grand entrances when they were um, going to be performing as well. So moving to the next strategy, it's really around how can you activate existing resources, community and site spaces, and local partners that are near um, your site. And I think that this is very applicable whether you're building a multifamily building or single family buildings. It's really important to understand the space that's around you, the community that's around you, and how you can um, incorporate the building that you're focused on to have access to those other community amenities. So I was going to lift up an example uh, from Art Space located in Hastings, Minneapolis. It is a six-story building, but they were located close to a lot of uh, trails, and one trail actually took folks out to the Mississippi River. So they were really interested in seeing how they could incorporate and connect with those community spaces. But they didn't have a lot of budget to actually incorporate much additional, many additional active design elements. So through their charrette, they realized that they could use the budget item that they had incorporated in their project around art and hiring local artists with this commitment to active design. And so they referred to this when they spoke to us as kind of their aha moment, and they were able to incorporate art into things like bike racks or the outdoor play equipment and hire artists to design those features of the property that could be used both for physical activity and to promote local artwork. Another way that they did this was actually having um, hiring local artists to put their art in exterior spaces that would lead folks from the property to the trails that were nearby. Right. Another example is in uh, Brooklyn, New York, where they wanted to activate an existing stairwell, but they were limited on the types of design changes they could make due to fire codes. And so one of, one of the things they landed on was actually having a community mural painting. And so they had residents participate in the process of painting murals along the stairwell to both promote social connection and encourage use of the existing stairs because people were able to walk by their own artwork when they used the stairs. I thought that was a great example. To take it into kind of the single family space, you'll see that this is an existing sidewalk. This is a location in Atlanta, Georgia, where they utilize the space next to a sidewalk within the community to integrate a uh, playscape for children. And then the last area that I wanted to focus on is how you can encourage or extend use, reduce barriers, and promote safety. And the two, I'll focus on two areas. One is really on encouraging use of outdoor spaces, 
Uh, I think I originally set this up so that you would start off by only seeing the, the playscape and the river because we worked with a group in Hammond, Louisiana, who was planning to have a playground on site. And when they engaged with the residents, a lot of community members lifted up that there had been several drownings within their community, and they were very worried about the proximity of the playscape to the canal. And so the developer and the residents were able to come to a solution to that by actually adding a natural bamboo fence that would prevent uh, children from accessing the canal and increase use of the playscape. Other things have come up very similar to that, like not having enough lighting for the fall and spring when you can still utilize playscapes later in the evening, but when there's no lighting, people don't feel safe in doing so. Additionally, things like adding water fountains actually increases the duration that people will stay and play, having areas to sit that are under shade. You know, the list can go on and on on how you can actually add to existing elements to activate spaces that already exist. And then additionally, you can, uh, I think another important population to focus on are older adults and designing for the, the needs and barriers that we have found with older adults. And this is both within single family residents and multifamily residents. A lot of the pictures I had were from multifamily, but a lot of the, the needs are the same. We'll hear time and time again from older adults that they feel isolated in their units and are often times don't want to leave their unit for a variety of reasons. And some of that can be related to um, wayfinding, uh, lighting, not feeling comfortable with the um, actual, you know, um, type of ground or flooring that is utilized. So it's just really important to take all of these things into consideration so that you're both encouraging mental health and physical activity. As you'll see, when, um, when people are navigating spaces and they have limitations, they're very aware of where benches are located and how they're going to find their way back. So having things like clear signage, I think within multifamily, uh, there's a lot of ways that you can do that. You can have wayfinding, you can have maps, you can have murals within different on different levels of the building. You can allow each unit to have a place that can be personalized so that folks can recognize their door and, and where they're supposed to enter. On a single family unit, similarly offering opportunities to personalize the space so that it is very recognizable is is very important. Additionally, the type of landscape surface that's being used, both internal and external, you want to think about things like uh, pea gravel being very difficult to navigate. You have grass, which is a little bit better, and then concrete, of course, is a more stable surface to navigate. Lighting and the direction of the lighting so that it's actually lighting the pathway versus to ensure that uh, people can feel comfortable navigating in that way, and that goes single-family, multi-family as well. And then the last thing I would mention is even on the internal spaces, you know, wood, carpet, and tile, those all have different risks for falls and trips, and that's something that older adults are aware of and take into account when they're navigating their apartment. There are obviously a lot of different strategies that can be incorporated in a unit, to or in a household to make um, the interior space more navigable. And we lift up a lot of those in our aging in place design guidelines, which are right here. Um, and hopefully Mary, you can wrap up. I know we were wrapping a little behind, so hoping you can just uh, just quickly wrap up. Yeah, sure thing. So I just want to reiterate that resident engagement activating existing and reducing barriers are kind of the three strategies I really wanted to bring home. And there are a couple of resources on the next two slides for folks that are interested in learning more. I'd encourage you to look through those. And once again, thanks so much, and sorry for the hiccup at the beginning. No, no worries. Thank you for juggling it with so much grace. As a mom of three, I'm totally uh, sympathetic and empathetic um, to that. Um, so as I just want to encourage folks to put in the chat any comments you're going to and uh, questions that you have for Paul, uh, Mary, or I, and we'll have a few minutes to do that. I don't currently see any questions there, so 
hope I have some in my back pocket, but uh, hoping I'll hear from you guys. The last principle is keeping it well maintained. And um, primarily, we direct you to a really wonderful resource developed by the National Center for Healthy Housing, which is a Healthy Homes Maintenance Checklist. And we've given you the link to it here. These slides, as Lyle said, will be mailed out to you, uh, emailed to you with a link uh, within two weeks of the completion of this webinar, we anticipate. The way that that document looks is it gives you the areas of your home, the yard and exterior, exterior roof, walls. And for each of the seasons, spring, fall, or whether it's annual, we suggest what needs to be done. This might be a great handout for you to use with um, your uh, customers, clients, anyone you're doing rehab, so that after you've left the rehab project, that homeowner or occupant has an idea on what they're supposed to do. So this is just an example of what the two-page document looks like. So I think at that point, I'm going to hand it, back, again, questions in the chat or the QA box. So, uh, well, do you want me to pose my questions, or do you want to go through your slides here? Pose your couple questions, Ellen. Um, yeah. And if we get a couple more that come in while we're while we're talking through those, then then we can bring those up. But right now, you go right ahead. Yeah. So, Paul, I was just curious. Um, you showed a lot of insulation stuff, and and these folks are doing rehab jobs. They're not necessarily energy experts. Like, what are the one or two things that you see done wrong all the time on insulation that if you were kind of monitoring a rehab project, you would say, I like, you know, equipment. It's like. Always make sure that you do a manual J calc. Great. On um, insulation or air sealing, um, what are two pieces of advice you might give to like a rehab specialist or someone running a rehab program? So for insulation, I would say that the, the two things that I would be most attentive to, one is, do you really get it to be even across like if you're doing attic insulation, is it even across the whole attic, or is it kind of mounted in some areas? Because if you have it, if you have places that are lower than, than others, you're going to lose some of the effectiveness. You're really trying to make sure that it's fully covered. Um, and then the other thing is making sure that you have not got the insulation, um, assuming it's something like cellulose, uh, too close to things that can get hot like chimneys. You really need to have uh, protection so that you don't cover over um, or come into contact with things that could get really hot and create a fire. Definitely not a healthy thing for a house. Uh, in terms of air sealing, have you really filled the whole gap or is it just, and is it suitable materials, it's not going to get um, damaged uh, by by insects or, or, or rodents or something like that, or is it or by uh, just thermal stresses, so have you used the right material and really filled the entire gap, not just still leaving some cracks here and there. Okay, Ellen. Ellen, I think you might be on mute. Uh, sorry, thank you. I just have one more question, Paul, that's come in on the chat. I'm just going to read it. It said so succinctly from uh, Joanne. Um, in our community, we have a development of a post-war single-family homes where the ducts were installed under concrete on the lower level. Over time, they have deteriorated and allowed water seepage and mold growth. What's an effective way to deal with this? Once once they put ducts inside the concrete, it's it is really difficult to deal with that. It is not a cheap thing to deal with. It really ends up needing to be somebody kind of going into the concrete and getting rid of the material that's had a lot of problems and trying to get in material that's better. The other option would be to kind of abandon those ducts, seal them off in some way, and try to put ducts somewhere else. I realize that's not going to be a very happy, satisfying answer, but ducts that are within the concrete, just if they aren't done right the first time, it's going to be really difficult, and, and that's it's unfortunate. 
Thanks, Paul. No, one minute left. Well, do I have time for one question for Mary, or should we just wrap? Go for it. All right, so Mary, I'm just curious, you know, thinking about the single family context, and I was thinking about what you said about gardening and lighting and also access to open spaces. Do you have advice for, if I'm doing single family rehab projects over and over again, is there anything I might want to just think about incorporating, I'm thinking about, um, at, uh, Resources on where you can go for an easy walk in your neighborhood, um, or you know, improving outdoor lighting so people um, might be able to make sure they don't trip and fall coming in, or thinking about whether it could be in budget to do a little raised bed on the gardening. But but curious, what your any thoughts more on a couple of things to keep in mind for single family or townhouse projects? And I think all of those ideas are are great ideas, and really, if I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but if you're able to engage the residents and understand where they really put their values and the things that they're interested in, I think that can really help guide what you might want to spend your extra budget on. And that's something that we've tried to incorporate over and over again in our enterprise green communities is that when you can match health needs to the community or to the residents, then you're going to be using your resources in a, um, a better way. So if it's a, um, if it's resident populations, even in single family or townhomes that wants to garden and would be interested in yeah. that, then I think it's a great use of resources. Um, but let's let the residents drive drive right. what they want. So Thanks. it might look at the active design guidelines and have a conversation with the folks exactly. in that environment. So yes, what, so you know. it's important to right. have bounds within your conversation that, so that it's things that are very feasible as well. Great. Back to you, Lil. I know we're one minute over, so. And that's quite all right. Thank you, Ellen, Mary, Michael, and Paul for participating today and for all of you for attending. We've got a couple of quick slides here to close off. Um, one of the questions out there was that if other courses are completed through record, listening to recording, do you still get credit? Um, yes, and I've got a slide on that here in a moment, and you'll be able to tell, you know, find out how to do that. Um, but for just for a moment, just want to highlight, we do have some select on-call direct technical assistance that's available uh, to everyone to incorporate the health at home standards from the guidelines document and everything we've discussed into your current rehab standards. It's relatively limited, but please, if you do think you'd like to have your, your rehab standards and specifications take a, taken a look at, then uh, send an email request over to energyaction at hud.gov by October 31st in order to get that through. Um, and here's what I'm talking about with the recordings. You can use the stuff that's on the website that's linked here. This presentation will be up within about two weeks. The other webinars should already be up there. There's both the webinar presentation slides and the recording that's there for you to review. Once you've re reviewed all of them, please make sure to send an email to this community compass training at aecom.com that gets directly to me and we will make sure you get credited for attendance at the uh, at these sessions. Uh, at this point in time, we have uh, concluded our session and we have concluded our season, our series. So we would like everyone that has uh, gone through this with us, thank you very much. For those of you who have attended one or a couple or several, thank you for coming all along the line and uh, have a great afternoon, a great rest of the week, stay safe, and we look to speak to you all very soon. That concludes our session for today.